Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Indigen Limited Q1 and FY25 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Abhishek. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Sejal. A very good morning to all of you, and thank you for joining us today for Indigene's earnings conference call for the first quarter ended financial year 2025. Today we have with us Ms. Manish Gupta, Indigene's Chairman and CEO, and Suhas Prabhu, CFO, to share the highlights of the business and financials for the quarter. I hope you've gone through our results release and the quarterly investor presentation, which have been uploaded on our website, as well as the stock exchange website. The transcript of this call will be available in a week's time on company's website. Please know that today's discussion may be forward-looking in nature and must be viewed in relation to risk pertaining to our business. After the end of this call, in case you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to the investor relations team. I now hand over the call to Manish to make his opening remarks. Thank, thank you, Abhishek. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this call uh, this morning. <coughs> Um, in our last earnings call, I had mentioned that Indigene is a fairly unique uh, company, unique definitely in the Indian context, and I can confidently say there's no one like us in the market. And this is something I'm going to uh, double-click on later again. Our thesis when we started 25 years back was that we, by bringing deep medical expertise and healthcare expertise, along with deep technology expertise, we can solve various problems in the healthcare industry. That remains our thesis today also. We are known in the market as a digital first commercialization partner to the global life science industry. Now, la after the last uh, earnings call, uh, we, got a, uh, we met a lot of you, uh, we got a bunch of questions and we also suggestions. A big thank you to all of you for the same. Based on the questions and suggestions we got uh, from all of you, uh, here is what I want to, uh, what I plan to do uh, in my uh, commentary uh, today. First is a double click on growth drivers, uh, and uh, so I'm going to spend some time talking about those. Also, describe the nature of our company a, a bit more, uh, and of course, our Q1 results. So let's start uh, and straight away dive into the growth drivers. Let me start off again with uh, what I had shared in the last call, uh, and uh, which is more macro. The global life science industry is north of 1.8 trillion in size. The operation spends in the areas that are addressable to us, um, as were highlighted in our RHP, and uh, presentation which we uploaded is more than 135 uh, billion dollars. Now you might have seen a number of 156. What we have done is taken out 25, uh, 21 million dollars, 21 billion dollars. Uh, which are essentially the spend on manufacturing, which is not really addressable to us. Now, out of these spends, sales and marketing, where we have uh, our largest footprint, contributes to 40% of the spend. Spending in all the areas we operate in, which is essentially uh, regulatory and medical affairs, uh, your sales and marketing, pharmacovigilance, are increasing at a rate of 6 to 7% annually. Outsourcing is growing much faster, around 9 to 14%, depending on the segments so, uh, I just uh, alluded to. Outsourcing in the uh, sales and marketing side is on the higher side. Apart from the increase in spend and outsourcing, there's also a shift to digital, which we again had alluded to in our last call and many of the discussions before that. More and more from the traditional channels of reps, or more people-oriented ways of doing things. There's a shift to digital and AI way of uh, doing things, which increases and continues to increase our addressable market. If you think about a global life science company, spend more than 25% of their revenues on average on SGNA. And by the way, in the SGNA line item, sales and marketing is the predominant spend. More than half of the top 30 pharma companies are spending more than 25% in SGNA. We also spend approximately 15% on R&D. So if you think about the GNA and R&D spent together, it's around 40%. All this presents an opportunity to use digital solutions to drive better physician and patient engagement at reduced cost, 
by deploying digital rather than physical channels or having an omni channel approach to engagement rather than some of the traditional uh, uh, channels given that we are a relatively small company in a very large market when we plan our execution this large market opportunity which i just spoke about of course gives us comfort uh, but when we plan uh, our uh, execution on the ground that is planned from perspective of clients accounts customer segments and when i say customer segments segment i'm talking about top big pharma big top 20 pharma mid size pharma biotech and devices our business segments becomes important because they represent different buying groups and different capability sets in our client organization now when i speak about growth uh, from a ground up perspective the way we think about it uh, for simplicity today i'm going to just focus on one customer segment the top 20 pharma companies that's an important segment because uh, top 20 pharma companies constitutes approximately two thirds of 66% of the global life science revenues and in this for indigen also 60% 68% of our revenues comes from these top uh, 20 pharma companies so if you think about it again we are pretty much mirroring uh, the global pharma industry here. and uh, even the last call i had spoken about how 65% of our revenues coming from europe which is very close to the industry spend uh, uh, and split uh, globally uh, from uh, 65% from us 32% from europe that was our spend and that's broadly how the spend is uh, uh, distributed uh, globally now again let me go down into some of the facts we report the following numbers and facts we work with all top 20 global pharma companies we have 65 active clients which are a bit uh, more than what we had reported in last quarter uh, we have 36 clients more than usd 1 million in revenue again a tad higher than what we had reported last quarter now if you double click a bit more on this our largest client today is uh, around 42 million dollars and we have two more clients that are more than usd 25 million dollars in revenue all three of them the 42 million dollar and these two other companies are top 3 pharma companies all these companies we believe have headroom to grow to 75 to 100 million dollars in the medium to long term in our top 20 clients right now Indigenes top 20 clients, 14 are top 20 pharma companies. So you think about those three, which I just spoke about, which are more than 25 million dollars. There are another five top 20 pharma companies where we have revenues in the 10 to 25 million dollar uh, range, which makes it 18 or uh, eight companies. There are another 10 companies with revenues in the range of 1 to 10 million dollars, and two of them. are less than 1 million dollars so we are talking about 12 companies of the top 20 pharma companies their revenues are less than 10 million dollars on one hand we have a largest client being at usd 42 million dollar and headroom to become a 100 million dollar account and on the other hand you have 12 of the top 20 pharma companies being less than usd 10 million revenue now this essentially means that just with these 20 customers Uh, or 20 clients of ours we can continue to be quite busy uh, for a uh, pretty long period of uh, time growing these uh, growing these clients in the medium term we believe we can move many of our clients that are in the usd 1 to 10 billion dollar range or 10 to 25 million dollar range to be more than usd 25 million dollars and uh, the slightly larger ones into more than 50 million dollars in the medium term and if i talk about the medium to long term to that 75 to 100 million dollar range which i alluded uh, earlier today in many of our top 20 clients we are having some very interesting conversations uh, and uh, pursuing some very interesting opportunities where we have the potential to partner with these companies at the next level of their either consolidation and execution of some of their more upstream marketing and medical uh, activities or increase their digital footprint in a significant way for brands across their life cycle so that's on the top 20 pharma companies beyond that we also continue to get more and more traction in the mid size biopharmaceutical companies 
Now the mid size we'll define as let's call it 20 to 100. Six of these anyway are our top 20 clients. This is a very dynamic segment where we continue to invest. Uh, companies view us as end-to-end -end partners. Uh, towards the end of Q1, we close some interesting deals again with this segment, which I'll allude to later in the discussion. Now, having spoke about opportunity in some of our, uh, from a client perspective, let me delve deeper into the segmental view of things. If you if we dive into our top 20 clients, a significant per percentage of revenues comes from enterprise commercial segment indicating a potential for further expansion into other segments like enterprise medical. Enterprise medical itself, the operational spends are approximately USD 40 billion dollars. This is essentially means, uh, it includes the regulatory and medical affairs and the safety and pharmacovigilance segment which have been called out in our DRHP uh, earlier. In the enterprise medical segment today, we have two clients that are more than USD 10 million 10 million dollars. There are 14 clients in the USD 1 to 10 million category, which means of the 36 USD 1 million plus clients which I spoke about earlier and uh, we report in our KPIs, only 16 clients, significant clients are in the enterprise medical segment and that presents an opportunity to expand not only 16 clients but also expand our enterprise medical capabilities and offering to the remaining 20 clients who are sub uh, 1 million uh, uh, or not in the present uh, today. Now that's one segment. Now if you look at omnichannel orchestration, which is our third uh, segment, we again have two clients that are more than USD 10 million. And outside of that, we have another three clients that are in the USD 1 to 10 million range. Which essentially means that again, out of our top 36 clients, who are uh, more than 1 million in uh, revenue, our omnichannel orchestration footprint is in five. Again, presenting the headroom to expand uh, into this uh, segment over the medium to long uh, term. Outside of this, clinical is a very large spend with outsourcing in excess of $50 billion per annum. Our foray here is nascent. And given the impact of technology and pressure of regulation, especially IRA, we believe it presents a large and interesting opportunity for us, and we continue to invest in this. Given our presence across the commercialization value chain, we are poised to increase penetration with each of the accounts by leveraging cross-sell potential. We have seen our land and expand strategy yield results consistently in the past. So that's a broad uh, uh, kind of a breakdown uh, from uh, ground up. Now again, let me come back to some of the macro uh, part of the industry. Uh, we, have also, we have spoken uh, about some of this in the last call, but I would like to reiterate that despite facing a challenging last year, uh, which is uh, calendar year 23, uh, with the top pharma companies seeing a downturn of uh, downturn of uh, or a negative growth rate of se or uh, degrowth of 7.1 percent for these top 20 pharma companies. The outlook for the industry remains positive now. 2024 is anticipated to be a year of growth, though a modest one, uh, setting the stage for recovering to 2022 levels for the industry. However, by FY28, which is essentially F uh, FY25 to 28, the industry is expected to grow. Uh, at a CAGR of 5 to 8 percent. This, uh, this uh, higher growth rate and the bump in growth rate is, is mainly attributed to upsurge in drug launches, which is always favorable to outsourcing opportunities. We are well positioned to capitalize on this expansion to increase penetration and market share. Now that's broadly about the industry. Some of it is what we had spoken about uh, last time. Let me come back <clears throat> to uh, talking about uh, the uniqueness of our company. We are neither a traditional IT company nor a BPO company. We operate in crucial business segments within the lifetime's domain. Leveraging our expertise in medical, commercial, and technology areas, we are likely to be one of the first business services companies from India doing this. Focus on a very large, specialized, and important industry, helping to solve for 
problems of future of sales and marketing for the uh, life science industry. It essentially means how do they engage, how does this industry engage with their end customers, which are physicians, patients, uh, and uh, payers. How to drive med uh, better regulatory medical compliance far more efficiently and effectively. And also reducing the time taken for cost involved. These are very important and significant problems the industry is uh, dealing with. And uh, we are helping uh, them uh, get much more effective and efficient in some of these areas. In our business, uh, uh, our engagements with our clients is for work which is a very critical nature and involves a business transformation in some of these very uh, mission critical and uh, business uh, critical areas at the end of our client, uh, for, of, of, for the clients. Clients take some time in, each, in the initial phases to get their act right and of course uh, in our partnership. But once that is set, uh, we see rapid scaling and that's been the trend in the past. Now, <clears throat> if I, uh, in that context, uh, we remain bullish about our mid to long term growth prospects given the opportunity side I just, uh, size up I just alluded to and our unique uh, positioning uh, in this uh, industry. We continue, we continue to remain committed to executing with a mid to long term focus aligned with the nature of our industry and business. Again, as I had spoken about in my last, uh, uh, in the last earnings call, uh, there will be quarters and years of high growth. There will be quarters and years uh, of uh, low growth, but growth will nevertheless continue to grow. Over a three to five year period, we believe we're going to be much, a much larger company. And now in that context, we would believe it's going to be much more appropriate to evaluate our performance over the medium term, let's say all three years or at least annually rather than our quarterly basis. To support our uh, growth in the medium to long term um, and the large opportunity size uh, we spoke about earlier, we continue to invest in enhancing our go-to-market capabilities, continue to invest in specialized domain expertise, therapeutic expertise, area expertise in areas such as sales, sales and marketing or pharma commercialization, regulatory affairs, clinical operations, medical affairs, and in developing advanced technology tools and platforms, many of which incorporate uh, Gen AI. Now coming to our uh, results, in, uh, results uh, for Q1, we recorded revenues of uh, INR 6765 uh, million, which is a 11.4% growth vis-a-vis -vis Q1 last year. And our EBITDA is one, uh, INR 1328 million, which is a higher, which is higher 14.5% growth compared to last year uh, Q1. Our PAT for the quarter is uh, INR 877 uh, million. Uh, which is 28.4% uh, higher than uh, Q1 last year. We have fully paid off our loan of USD 48 uh, million, uh, which was one of the objects of uh, capital raised from the IPO. This was the largest component of the fund raised from the IPO, uh, and uh, that has been consummated uh, now. From a quarter on quarter perspective, the performance will appear a bit underwhelming. However, we continue to bullish, remain bullish about growth in the medium uh, term, given not only the market opportunity I just explained, but also some of the market engagement we see right now, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. But before that, let's just talk about the current quarter. We had a few headwinds from a growth uh, standpoint. One of our top five clients, which faced certain challenges in 2023, continues to make effort in overcoming these challenges, challenges impacting our revenues from the client adversely. We believe from all the conversations we have this with this client, even that we are deeply embedded, this should stabilize and get better towards the end of the calendar year. On top of that, we had another of our top five clients undergoing restructuring and re of some of their processes, which impact, impacted us adversely in Q1. We again understand from our conversation with them, this is a near-term issue, which is unlikely to continue for more than a few months, and then activity and spend levels are anticipated to back to earlier levels in H2. So coming back, uh, now coming back to medium term, compared to last year, same time, pipeline is much healthier than it was. Quality of conversations with clients, much better and much more strategic. 
strategic in uh, nature which gives us confidence about driving robust growth in the medium term towards the end of q1 we had four strategic wins for mid size pharma uh, uh, which provide a, a, an impetus for growth in the coming uh, quarter these are very interesting deals we also have uh, um, we have also have some very interesting deals shaping up uh, which will provide an impetus impetus for growth in the coming uh, quarters most of these deals and opportunities are with top 20 pharma companies where they are looking at the next level of consolidation and aggregation of some of the upstream marketing and medical activities i spoke about that earlier uh, and we believe they will get initiated in our h2 as companies start budgeting for these at an enhanced scale in the next calendar year and hence would reflect starting rq4 with these promising uh, developments we remain confident of steady growth in fy25 and uh, uh, as mentioned earlier about um, in the medium term with this i'll pass on the mic to suvar for more details on the financial performance suvar on to you thank you manish once again a very good morning uh, to everyone and uh, we appreciate your participation on this call uh, today uh, let me start by getting into the details of the financial performance for the quarter more particularly the margin an important uh, thing to note we have made a change in the way we report the bit up versus what we have been uh, doing in the past uh, by excluding interest income this is relevant as we have more cash on the balance sheet understandably with the 7600 million rupees of um, ipo proceeds uh, coming in uh, which are invested in interest bearing uh, instrument um pens excluding interest income from the ebitda would be a better representation of the operating performance of the business this change is also based on the feedback from many of you that we interacted over the past uh, couple of months and is consistent in the manner ebitda is computed and disclosed by other companies exclusion of uh, interest income from ebitda would result in reduction of margin by approximately 150 bits to 250 bits in each of the quarters of the past period against what we had reported i would also request you all to refer slide 12 of the investor presentation that has been filed uh, with the exchanges and is also available on our uh, website for uh, the revised uh, ebitda workings for the past uh, years and quarters going forward this is the manner in which we would uh, uh, continue to report uh, ebitda as uh, manish already mentioned our um, revenue in q1 uh, is inr 6765 million which is a 11.4% year on year growth and a 0.5% quarter on quarter growth our margins came in stronger with ebitda of uh, rupees 1328 million at a 19.6% rate versus 19.1% in the corresponding uh, quarter last year this 50 bits increase in ebitda combined with the interest income uh, increase from the higher uh, investable cash on the balance sheet and the lower depreciation amortization rate has further positively impacted our earnings with the pat margin coming at 13% versus 11.3% in the corresponding uh, quarter last year and therefore pat of 877 million inr is a growth of 28.3% year on year manish already alluded to the impact on the sequential revenue growth with a couple of our uh, top 5 clients having internal restructuring uh, and um, other related issues impacting our revenue in our um, quarter 1 of the current fiscal and this also impacted the margin as we continue to maintain capacity for higher volumes from these uh, clients and hence our sequential ebitda margin contracted by 230 bits to 19.6 percent versus 21.9% in q4 of uh, last year 
as these volumes from these uh, clients ramp up in future we expect this to get corrected further we continue to strengthen our technology and automation initiatives which we believe will also have a positive impact on the margin in the future we anticipate that the ebitda margin would have a similar trajectory as the past fiscal year with a stronger h2 compared to h1 with the rate for the full year and even beyond being in the early 20s we are now a zero debt uh, company and the resultant zero interest cost impacts back favorably going forward by approximately 100 bits to sum up on the margins our focus on maintaining and growing ebitda margin continues and with the imminent interest cost reduction going forward the pbt and pat margin should also get impacted positively finally our return on equity post the primary raise in the ipo continues to be in the 20s at a healthy 21% and uh, return on capital employed net of cash is a very healthy 48% uh, with that uh, let me take a pause and move on to the questions um, that uh, either me or manish can answer uh, for uh, all of you so you can be open for q and a sure sir thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star and 2 participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles the first question is from the line of abhishek bhandari from nomoda please go ahead yeah thank you for the opportunity uh, manish you know thank you for the very detailed opening remarks where you spoke in detail about your top accounts and your ambition in the medium to long term i have one question over there you know uh, if you could share you know what are the timelines you're looking to grow from this 40 to 100 on your top and the next two from 25 to 100 and in the context of what happened in the history you know how long did it take you to you know scale up these accounts how do you go about it in terms of cross selling and what are the key impediments in you know achieving that the place where i'm asking you from is you know while we look at the time it all looks very strong uh, but uh, you know the uh, the growth rates what we currently have are just around you know maybe around 10 11% year on year uh, while the numbers are talking about are much much higher so if you could give you know some path over there that will be helpful sure so uh, for, thank you for the question uh, abhishek uh, now it's very difficult to call out exactly how many quarters because we, uh, as you could imagine we are uh, talking uh, or uh, uh, 68% of our revenue is coming from the top 20 pharma companies uh, and they have their own pace of uh, doing uh, things um, now in the past uh, again i had spoken about uh, in the last uh, call that if we take a decadal view right uh, we had grown in the order of 24 uh, 25% now of course that was a smaller uh, base and in the past also we have seen that uh, customers would uh, continue to be at a certain level probably go up right uh, once in a while a little bit of they can be a bit down right uh, we don't see significant downturns and then as soon as they get one of their activities together right which is more of an internal transformation uh, we see a big surge happening right uh, Uh, and we believe some of that will continue to play out now to get more specific as i had mentioned uh, uh, in uh, the commentary earlier today we are seeing a much stronger pipeline right uh, in general if i look at the numbers uh, including our even the q1 closed uh, deals the quality of conversations and opportunities we are pursuing are very strategic in nature uh, we have spoken about how we drive consolidation across a set of marketing activities Uh, and i remember meeting many of you and saying this if you think about 1 to 10 processes right uh, we would be doing let's say 5 to 8 5 to 9 for our com- for customers now for the first time in so many years now we are also think seeing customers talk about processes 3 4 which are much more upstream and the reason they are doing it that they are gearing up for new launches as have never been uh, happened before right and they are seeing that how can i get more and more uh, uh, budgets lined up for those new launches so some of the pause which is happening 
is also happening because companies are right now uh, trying to amass uh, get prepared for the imminent uh, launches over the next few years right and uh, uh, rejigging their internal uh, processes uh, so in that context i would say that we expect a uh, lot of some of these bump ups to happen over the medium term Got so it. i want to add on something yeah. Um, and also, uh, just to probably add uh, there, with uh, some of the larger uh, pharma companies, we also see that the decision making uh, gets uh, pushed towards the end of the calendar year, which uh, is also a reflection of uh, their planning cycles, which are uh, giant to December. And uh, as Manish mentioned, we see uh, 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 typical ramp ups uh, take uh, about uh, four to six uh, quarters uh, uh, post uh, initiation of uh, a, a new uh, engagement or expansion in the engagement. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so, Manisha, this was my second and last question. Uh, sorry if I missed it in your opening remarks. But if you look at your, you know, uh, top five, top ten account uh, portfolio, uh, top account has done well. Uh, whereas, you know, the remaining top 2 to 5 or call it 2 to 10, uh, you know, there is a uh, still a weakness. I think you mentioned that you, you have some confidence on those growth recovering paths. So if you could, you know, tell us, you know, what kind of projects are these and by when do you think the ramp up of these will happen uh, in the course of fiscal 25? So it's going to be a very uh, client specific, uh, Abhishek. Uh, client, as you said, top, uh, our largest client is growing and there's a very strong pipeline uh, even after this uh, growth. Uh, the remaining two in the top 25, uh, uh, that's where some of the weakness in the quarter one came in. One of them, we believe, was a very short-term thing, which is where I said we should believe it should get corrected in a few months. The other company is going through a bit of a churn, so that might take a few quarters. right? Uh, now, if I think about other customers between, uh, uh, let's call it, outside of these three uh, customers, in general, apart from one or two companies, uh, which are facing their own challenges, right? Uh, they're missing their earning guidelines thing, and hence restructuring, reorgs, and all this stuff. Uh, across the board, uh, we see a much stronger pipeline, right? Uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, we are reasonably confident that again in the next few quarters we should start seeing a lot of these uh, companies ramp up. The whole pyramid of uh, number of customers above 25 uh, million, 10 to 25 number of million dollar customers. We believe over the next, uh, let's call it 18 to 24 months, we should be in a much better shape from a KPI perspective. Got it. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Swath, and all the best for Fiscal 25. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Karan Surana from Monarch AIS. Please go ahead. Hello, good morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your opening remarks. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you are. Yeah, so, sir, um, just want to probe a little bit on the demand environment. You know, you said that we've seen some softness in the last couple of quarters, right? So, uh, when you're having conversations with them, what conversations are you having on the spends with the top clients? Because as we see on your slide 18, sir, our client 3 and 4, like you already alluded, uh, did see significant ram downs, right? Our client three went from 35 million US dollars to 29 in 24, FY24, right? So, uh, can you just help us understand the spending environment with these clients and um, what transpired us to see this ram down post three years of very strong growth in these accounts? Yes, so, so this is uh, one uh, customer which uh, had has its own issues, uh, right? Um, over uh, in this customer also, I think we would have alluded that at least in FY21 uh, and uh, even 22, we had some bit of a COVID-related uh, revenues as well, right? Uh, actually, FY22 uh, FI and FY23, there was some bit of COVID-related uh, revenues. Those are one-offs, right, uh, which had to go, and we were very clear of that. We stated that uh, uh, earlier. So that's one uh, impact. Uh, subsequent uh, to that, this is a customer which is going through significant churns, and that's the customer I alluded to in the earlier question, which we believe it's going to take a few more quarters probably for them to stabilize, and then for uh, for things to uh, pick up. They have their own revenue issues, big uh, client reorganizations, and things like that. 
So, Aki, you want to add on anything? Yeah, and uh, having said that, uh, Karan, uh, we continue to uh, engage with them on uh, looking at uh, how to shape, uh, uh, you know, uh, their uh, commercial uh, uh, activities as um, they come out of these. Uh, uh, their internal um, uh, reorg and other uh, priorities in the near future. And, um, uh, you know, we uh, are uh, deeply engaged on being the digital uh, uh, partner for this um, client. And, uh, uh, of course, the uh, priority today is uh, for the client is to uh, uh, get their act together and uh, then uh, we see uh, that uh, opportunity likely to move uh, forward. And again, I'm going to just double click on um, uh, and uh, probably reiterate some of the stuff which I mentioned earlier. Uh, across these clients uh, and uh, uh, in these top three, right, uh, and many more clients across the board, today we are seeing that after having gone through, let's call it a wave one of consolidation in digital activities, they are now gearing up for wave two. Right, uh, uh, and uh, uh, thinking about reorganizing to drive consolidation across those sets of activities. Uh, and uh, we believe we are very well positioned uh, uh, to help them uh, do that. Got it, sir. So, sir, since our Q1 was kind of flat QOQ, for us to kind of replicate the last year's growth, the ask rate from Q2 to Q4 on a CQGR is quite high. So um, just to kind of understand, is it naturally that our Q1 is usually soft and our growth picks up in the later half of the year? Or what makes us feel confident that at least we can replicate last year's growth rate? Or we might see this year, uh, our year-on-year -year growth on a full-year basis might be a little bit lower than FI24. So just getting some sense of um, post-Q1, what could transpire from Q2 to Q4? I'll, uh, let's ask, uh, double click on some other things, uh, but uh, uh, again, as I had alluded earlier, uh, that uh, our uh, pipeline uh, deal closures in Q1 and uh, the quality of uh, opportunities we are pursuing at reasonable stages are much more healthier than what we had in Q1 last year. Q1 last, last uh, calendar year uh, was a tough year for pharma in general. Right, uh, and uh, companies were dealing with that. There was a year of slow grow growth. It was a year, actually, degrowth for the pharma industry. It was a year of IRA being introduced as a regulation. Uh, and I think everybody now realizes where what the external landscape is, and things are looking better for them. Uh, and uh, from a metric perspective, pipeline deals, all the stuff is much healthier uh, uh, for us. And that's what makes us uh, confident. Uh, about uh, this year as well. But Suhas, I'll pass it on to you for more uh, uh, details. Yes. But, um, Manish already mentioned in his opening uh, remarks um, about four um, uh, opportunities that uh, got converted. Um, and this uh, is what we are looking uh, forward to from a future perspective, given that uh, those have uh, um, already been bagged uh, by uh, Indigene. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, uh, pipeline um, and uh, the kind of uh, uh, conversations, the quality of the conversations that we are uh, having, we see that uh, um, uh, impacting us positively. The other thing that I would like to also highlight is that um, while our top um, five client uh, concentration, if you look at, uh, uh, got impacted adversely, um, actually uh, extend that to top uh, 20, You'll see that uh, uh, you know that has not uh, been impacted as uh, adversely, which indicates that uh, there is growth in uh, the rest of the uh, clients in our uh, top uh, 20. And uh, uh, you know, so uh, it's business as usual in many of our uh, accounts, um, more specifically outside of the two that uh, Manish uh, mentioned. And uh, that also gives a fair indication of, uh, uh, you know, why we continue to remain uh, bullish on uh, um, our current year and uh, beyond. Um, so just to probe a little bit, however, it's encouraging that, you know, the deal pipeline or the pipeline that you guys are seeing is very strong. But just from a CQGR basis, I just didn't really get a sense whether we feel confident that in the 2H or post-Q2, 
that um, you know our growth trajectory could replicate last year's or we could uh, even do better than last year's. Uh, again, Karan, I would uh, say we have demonstrated uh, in the past an ability to grow uh, at uh, significant rates, uh, whether you look at it uh, uh, on a yearly basis or even on a medium-term uh, basis, and we therefore continue to uh, uh, if, uh, you know, uh, uh, emphasize that uh, is something that we have uh, done in the past, and uh, given the quality of uh, uh, conversations, pipeline, and even deal closures that we uh, are uh, seeing, uh, we remain uh, bullish uh, about the current year and future. Okay, sir. Just squeezing in last one, sir. Uh, Sorry, traditionally, sir, I you, sir. May I request you to rejoin the queue for your follow-up question? Okay, okay. I'll join. I'll rejoin the queue. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning, and uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, first, um, when I see the segmental performance this quarter... Sorry to interrupt you, sir. May I request you to please use your handset? Yeah, sure. One uh, hi, is it better? Yes, sir, much better. Yeah, so my question is, if I look at the segmental uh, performance on a sequential basis, uh, apart from enterprise medical solutions, which has grown by 17%, every other segment has declined. Uh, I was just curious if, uh, you know, uh, Enterprise Medical Solution has any contribution from Trilogy acquisition, which we closed towards the end of Q4. Yeah, so thanks, Abhishek. Uh, uh, so uh, from a, a segmental performance perspective, uh, yes, uh, Trilogy has contributed. Uh, uh, to the because the uh, trilogy being a, red, a regulatory writing uh, business uh, uh, rolls up into our uh, medical segment. But having said that, it's a very non-material uh, uh, acquisition, uh, and uh, uh, the two uh, client engagements that Manish uh, spoke about, where uh, we had a decline in volumes, has adversely impacted the. Uh, commercial uh, segment uh, more specifically, the enterprise uh, commercial uh, segment, and that uh, showcases uh, the decline uh, uh, quarter on quarter in the commercial uh, segment. The other two segments, uh, again, while uh, it shows a decline, it's also uh, uh, on a very small uh, base where uh, we also have project by project kind of uh, business being a little more uh, significant than the uh, two enterprise uh, segments which contribute 80 to 83 percent of our revenues, and uh, therefore, you know, on a quarter basis, there might be some um, uh, uh, impact, sometimes positive, negative. But I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, the recurring business and the longer run uh, business uh, proportion are uh, higher in uh, the enterprise uh, segments, which is enterprise commercial and enterprise medical. And uh, your observation on Trilogy is accurate, but uh, it's not a ma material contribution. Sure. Um, next question, um, maybe to Manish. Uh, see, uh, I, from what I understand, you know, the work we do uh, is a very non-discretionary uh, sort of work, something which, uh, you know, pharmacovigilance or even SNM for drugs which are already in the market, um, they are, um, you know, very critical for all the pharma companies uh, for their operation. So, um, you know, in that context, uh, you know, such sharp decline by few clients, uh, you know, what are they cutting? I mean, because this, if, if this is non-discretionary important, is this, uh, you know, kind of rate cuts that we are seeing or some closures of the program? Uh, just explain, uh, you know, uh, what kind of <clears throat> impact we are seeing in terms of, uh, you know, our uh, engagements with them. So let me, uh, and uh, these are, uh, that's a good question, um, Sheikh, and uh, if, I, uh, uh, if I explain, uh, it's client by client, right? Uh, one of our clients where I said uh, they face problems in, in 23 and continue to face problems, it's going to take some time. Uh, there they are having uh, a combination of a uh, few things. One is in a general, uh, given the pressure they have on their financials across the board, uh, uh, cuts, right, uh, and significant reorganizations. 
uh, which has resulted in general volume uh, dipping, right? Uh, so there are many things contributing to this uh, client. Uh, whereas the other one where we said it's a monthly, uh, it, it looks like that it's a very temporary thing. Uh, there is a model shift. What happens is a lot of our business, at least in the enterprise commercial segment, uh, as I explained to many of you, that there were agencies across the world doing work for them, for the brand teams. Now they consolidated these activities, right, uh, and said active, some of these activities will be done in a centralized way, get executed by uh, Indigene. Now, in some reorgs and all that stuff which has happened for this uh, client, there has been leakage and local markets gone ahead and spend more on their own, right, uh, uh, which is not a traditional uh, thing. Uh, and of course, this company is committed to more centralized ways of doing things, has not only is not only strengthening that again, right, uh, plugging the leakages, but also saying there are a bunch of other things which we had left to the market will also be centralized globally. Uh, and that's a, a, a thing uh, which uh, hit. Activities continued, of course. All right, and, and this is the client where you think in a couple of months things can come back. Yeah, absolutely. Just yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shift. Yeah. Okay, great, great. That's very helpful. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all the participants, please limit your question to two per participant. If you have a follow-up question, I request you to rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of VP Rajesh from Banyan Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just trying to understand your pricing model. Sorry to interrupt uh, you, sir. May I request you to please use your handset? Yeah, is it better now? No, sir. Can you come near to the mic and speak? Yeah, I am close to the mic right now. So, uh, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, we are, we are okay. We can make, uh, we can get the question, please. Just. Yeah. So, my question was, you know, I'm new to the company, so I'm just trying to understand your pricing model. Are you uh, selling a product where you have a SaaS model or is it typical IT service type of model? Just if you can comment on that. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rajesh. Uh, so uh, we are not a, a SaaS product, or uh, our engagement uh, models are not uh, similar to the uh, uh, SaaS and subscription or licensing uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, company. Uh, it would be closer to the uh, uh, IT uh, uh, services kind of uh, model uh, with a bit of uh, nuance. Um, we typically engage with our customers on multi-year framework agreements or master service agreements uh, with the rates um, uh, contracted for the entire tenor. This could be two years, three years, even five-year uh, uh, tenors. The rate cards tend to be a combination of both uh, uh, time and material or FTE kind of uh, billing and therefore um, you know, per hour or per day or per month uh, kind of uh, rates, but also uh, a set of uh, predefined deliverables wherein there is a unit price uh, which is already uh, defined, and even these could be having multi-level complexities or tiering, uh, right? Um, and uh, therefore, um, when we design a SOW, which is typically on an annual basis, where these rates and the volumes that uh, are estimated uh, get aggregated and converted into a value. Uh, there is a combination of time and material and fixed price uh, construct in the SOW when we uh, contract. And this is uh, typical uh, for uh, both enterprise commercial and enterprise medical, which is about uh, 82, 83 percent of our uh, business. So that's our uh, typical engagement and pricing. Great, appreciate that. And my second question is that, you know, uh, given what we are uh, seeing in the U.S. market, uh, there could be a potential recession or uh, definitely a slowdown that the market is anticipating over there. So in that context, uh, as you know, it pans out, uh, you know, how do you see the uh, sales and marketing piece of the business that you talked about getting impacted, meaning your customers, uh, which are the top companies, five companies, uh, especially your top clients, coming back on some of that spend. So any any thoughts on how are you thinking about that? So from our perspective, uh, and I think I've alluded to that in the last uh, call, Sils, uh, we don't see, um, 
uh, healthcare and definitely pharma sector uh, being correlated to economic cycles, right? Uh, uh, what we have, uh, this is a sector which is uh, much more resilient, right, uh, compared to uh, other sectors in a uh, downturn. This sector has its own innovation cycles, right? Uh, there are a bunch, for example, I spoke about a bunch of launches which are coming up and hence growth will be stronger. Uh, sometimes if you have a bunch of uh, uh, patent expiries, right, uh, which could cause slowness or like last year what happened was a bit of a decline. So those declines are, by the way, really once in a while. Uh, 23 they happened, before that they had happened in 2012 or so, right? Uh, typically it's a long secular growth followed by one year of patent expiries coming together and impacting uh, things. But uh, it's reasonably immune uh, or resilient vis-a-vis -vis, uh, economic cycles. Okay, thank you. That's all for now. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohan Bora from Envision Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. So uh, first question uh, was on the competitive landscape uh, that you see today. So basically, as I understand, uh, we also compete with the IT companies of the world in uh, some part of the business. And uh, with the advancement of AI, their offerings on AI to the clients. How do you see that shaping up? Also, another aspect to this is that comp the, com the pharma companies, their own uh, AI advancements impacting you know, the business that we can uh, garner from them. So how do you see that shaping up uh, is the first question. Uh, and then probably I can ask the second one. Sure. So before I, I think I would again want to reiterate, we are a very different company. You've got to not think about us as IT services company. Uh, uh, we, are, we are a business services company. We are helping pharma companies do sales and marketing more effectively, managing the regulatory compliances more effectively, right? These are, uh, or uh, helping in clinical trials. It's an area which we continue to invest in. Uh, these are super critical areas, business areas. 21% of our people are medical doctors, PhDs, uh, pharmacologists, right? Working with data engineers, data scientists. On one hand, omnichannel orchestrators, digital experts, uh, right, therapeutic area experts, oncology experts, bunch of those kind of profiles uh, on the other end. As you can imagine, that's a very different profile set uh, from, uh, right, uh, from any of the IT services uh, uh, companies. And uh, now, uh, coming back from a competitive landscape perspective, the, three, uh, the few large categories or the incumbents in this space servicing the areas I spoke about are, one is CROs, right? The clinical research companies, they are especially on the medical side of the business, there are agencies, specialized healthcare agencies, and what is called contract sales organizations, right, uh, servicing the remaining two segments, right, which is enterprise commercial and uh, omnichannel uh, activation. Those are the incumbents. Significant market share uh, still remains uh, uh, with them. And as a factor of more and more shift towards, shift towards digital, shift towards centralization, driven by the needs of uh, uh, better compliance, better cost, and obviously doing digital in a much more effective way, uh, right? Uh, company like us has the right to exist and uh, win. Uh, now, uh, so, uh, so to that extent, yeah, those are the competent sets. Now, of course, we see IT companies playing in some of these things. Right, uh, and uh, not so many, not so much Indian ID companies, but I would say some of the global ones, uh, which are more credible. Outside of that, as far as AI is concerned, our strategy as Indigene in some many of the areas uh, for a long period of time has been bringing expertise, uh, specialized expertise in various areas, and technology tools and platforms uh, to deliver better outcomes. We started investing in these AI-based tools way back in 2016-17, when JNI was not launched, but we were using traditional machine learning, computer vision, NLP type of uh, uh, te technologies and techniques to build tools which are delivering differentiated outcomes. That enabled us to grow uh, uh, and win much more, right? Now with JNI coming in, we see that as an opportunity that a lot of processes which are being done in a traditional way the level of accuracy and the benefit which can be driven by incorporating Gen AI in the solutions becomes much more. 
So MetNet, it's, uh, we believe in the medium to long term, that's going to be an uh, opportunity for us. Uh, got it. And on the other piece about you know companies uh, doing it themselves, basically, so so uh, you know uh, reducing our uh, share in the wallet. Does that uh, you know is, does that worry you? Not really. A uh, thing. So some of the things which we do, especially specialize in, these are very complex, multi skills, multi geography, right type of uh, engagements. Right. Uh, we will have people sitting in Bangalore, and those are not going to be one set of skill sets. There will be digital experts, there will be technology experts, there will be content experts, right? Uh, and just think about multiplying this complexity uh, in 40 countries, right? Where we'll be executing these things. Yeah. Uh, and technology changing every day. That's not a pharma company uh, in terms of things. Skill sets which are very homogeneous, right? Uh, uh, and I would say, uh, so those are the things which companies are trying to internalize uh, with the advent of uh, Gen AI. But ours is operationally much more complex. Uh, got it, understood. And uh, my second question uh, was uh, on the uh, four new wins that you said, uh, mid-sized companies. So a bit more color on that would be helpful, you know, the size of the companies, uh, the area of offering probably. And uh, just uh, one thing on the uh, dead part, so uh, the interest outlook going forward uh, will be negligible? Yes, yes, the interest uh, outflow, let me take the second uh, question. Interest outflow is uh, going to be zero. We repaid the debt uh, um, uh, pretty much uh, just before uh, the end of the quarter. So uh, from Q2 onwards, uh, interest outflow would be uh, 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 zero. Um, and uh, a bit more color on the uh, uh, wins that Manish um, mentioned. Uh, the, there are... Uh, Three of them are in the commercial uh, uh, area and uh, one in the uh, medical um, area. Uh, one is out of the four is actually an expansion of uh, um, uh, an existing uh, engagement in a significant way. And uh, uh, these companies uh, tend to be uh, of a size, uh, give or take a little around $5 billion in uh, revenue. Right, uh, some might be a billion lower, uh, some would be in the range of five to ten billion dollars. So while yeah, these are mid-sized companies in the industry context, these are fairly large uh, uh, organizations, uh, global operations, and uh, multiple products. Understood. Thank you. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harsh Jorasia from Valum Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, good morning, sir. Thanks for giving this opportunity. So I have uh, one question. So basically, in last two, three months, we have seen uh, the healthcare and or pharma GCC getting set up in India. So wanted to know, like, what can be the potential revenue impact of GCC, uh, healthcare GCC getting uh, set up in uh, India on us? And secondly, uh, could you please help us understand, like, what is the kind of work, what is getting done in GCC, and what we are doing? Uh, can you differentiate between uh, two of them? So that's it. Sure, sure. So, so that's a good question. And uh, 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 now let me start with the uh, uh, one. Every GCC is a pursuing different strategies uh, over here. There are a few GCCs uh, which are doing a lot of IT work, right? Uh, they realize they don't want to do. Uh, they want to extern, uh, take some of the external IT spend and uh, do it internally, given it's a very homogeneous skill set required, right? Uh, uh, we have seen uh, uh, some of those. Some of the high value, very high value added uh, medical stuff which was being done, we see some of them doing this part. But net-net, one of the big challenges we as Indigene have faced over the last 10, 15 years that we are going and they're selling to companies that, you know what, we could do a lot of your very high-end, super critical work of helping you reach out to your physicians, patients, regulators, payers, right? Uh, develop all the material required, run the analytics, campaigns, build technology, right, uh, in an integrated uh, way with a significant portion of our teams being in India. That was not very, uh, customers were slightly, uh, I would say, skeptical about that, right? Uh, while they were uh, IT services or being IT being done out of India was accepted, uh, but some of these business services they are always uh, worried about. Um, the establishment of GCCs at one level, uh, actually from our perspective, is an indication that uh, customers are buying the ability that a lot of this work can be done out of India. 
So net net, uh, from our perspective, we believe it's a very positive thing, right? Uh, we don't have to sell India anymore, uh, which we used to, we, which we had to do a lot uh, earlier. All the GCCs that are getting set up, all of them are our customers, and we, while they are setting up some capabilities on their own, we are having conversations with them. What are the capabilities they would like to run with us? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, we will take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Thank you so much uh, for uh, joining this call and uh, for a lot of uh, questions. I know we couldn't answer all the questions. Happy to please reach out to uh, our uh, investor relationship uh, team and uh, we would be uh, happy to answer those uh, questions uh, offline. So, uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to uh, uh, meeting uh, you all in the next uh, earnings uh, call as well. And uh, thanks uh, again for your participation. Have a good day. On behalf of Indigen Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect.